Hello everyone. This week, in week seven, we talk about natural justice as one of the key principles of admin administrative law. And after studying this topic, you should be able to discuss and explain the principle of natural justice. And when it applies, we will also know more about the hearing rule as well as the rule against bias. The principle of natural justice is of common law origin as uh, we will see, and this principle was enunciated by Lord Selborne in the case of Spackman versus Plumstead District Board of Works, where he said that a statutory decision maker has a duty to observe the substantial requirements of justice to provide parties an opportunity to be heard and to act honestly and impartially. In that case, uh, Lord Selborne said, no doubt in the absence of special provisions as to how the person who is to reside is to proceed, the law will imply no more than that the substantial requirements of justice shall not be violated. He is not a judge in the proper sense of the word, but he must give the parties an opportunity of being heard before him and stating their case and their view. He must give notice when he will proceed with the matter, and he must act honestly and impartially, and not under the dictation of some other person or persons to whom the authority is not given by law. There must be no malversation of any kind. There would be no decision within the meaning of the statute if there was anything of that sort done contrary to the essence of justice. In Kiowa versus West, uh, Justice Mason then said that the law in relation to administrative decisions has now developed to a point where it may be accepted that there is a common law duty to act fairly in the sense of according procedural fairness in the making of administrative decisions which affect rights, interests, and legitimate expectations subject only to the clear manifestation of a contrary statutory interpretation. Now, from this statement, for example, we will at least uh, see two things. One is that the principle of natural justice, as a duty to be observed, is not something that is new. It is a principle that has long been associated with uh, the duty of judges to, to observe the duty of, of natural justice and to act judicially, which involves the uh, observance of procedural fairness, for example. However, the, it is as part of the uh, principles enunciated by the courts, it is now clear that uh, the duty of, natural, of uh, giving natural justice is no longer a duty to be observed by judges, but it is a duty as well that falls on the shoulders of executive decision makers. However, in relation to the duty of executive decision makers who are to make a, uh, decisions by observing the principles of natural justice, the statement uh, of Mason J. in Keogh versus West tells us that it is actually possible for Parliament to state that the rules of natural justice will not apply in a specific instance. So what that means is that the principle of natural justice can be overridden or displaced by a clear manifestation of parliament. So it can displace a common law principle that has been uh, espoused by the courts. However, as we will see later on, it is not a uh, the displacement of the rules of natural justice is not something that is lightly taken. It requires a clear manifestation or a clear intention at the part of parliament before it can be said that the rules of natural justice do not apply. And we're going to look at that uh, in a short while as well. In Annettes versus McCann, Chief Justice Mason and Justices Dean and McHugh said it can now be taken as settled that when a statute confers power upon a public official to destroy, defeat, or prejudice a person's rights, interests, or legitimate expectations, the rule of natural justice require the exercise of that power unless 
they are excluded by plain words of necessary intentment. Now, there is actually a problem of terminology in the sense that in the High Court, when justices speak of the duty of natural justice, it is often as associated with the notion of acting judicially or observing procedural fairness. And some would say, some of the justices would say that there is no natural, there is no duty on the part of executive decision makers to observe natural justice. The more proper terminology should be that the observance, for example, of procedural fairness. However, there is a general judicial agreement as to the meaning of natural justice and how natural justice is closely related to the duty of a decision maker to act judicially and observe procedural fairness. In Keo versus West, uh, Mason, Justice Mason said that nat natural justice and fairness are to be equated. And it has been recognized that in the context of administrative decision making, it is more appropriate to speak of a duty to act fairly or to accord natural justice. Now, there are actually two parts to the doctrine of natural justice, which, as we've pointed out, uh, is closely related with or even synonymous to the notions of acting judicially and observing procedural fairness. And these two parts of the doctrine uh, were uh, enunciated or stated by Justice Dean in the case of Australian Broadcasting Tribunal versus Pont, where he said that the duty to observe the requirements of natural justice or procedural fairness involves the absence of the actuality or the appearance of disqualifying bias and the according of an appropriate opportunity to be heard. So those two parts correspond to the prior hearing rule or in Latin or what in Latin is said as odi alteram partem, which is hear the other side. And the second part of the doctrine of natural justice is the no buyer's rule. Nemo debet esse judex in propria sua causa, in Latin, which means no one can be a judge of his own cause. Now let's look at the first uh, component of the rule of natural justice, or the doctrine of natural justice, which is the prior hearing, hearing rule. The rule requires that a person whose rights, interests, or legitimate expectation may be affected by a decision of a decision maker must be given a prior notice of a decision that may be made or information that may influence the decision and the right to submit a reply. So that is a clear rule. Before a person's rights, interests, or legitimate, legitimate expectations may be affected or interfered from, interfered by a decision of a decision maker, that person must be given an opportunity to be heard. In Laws versus Australian Broadcasting Tribunal, Chief Justice Mason and Justice Brennan stated this rule as requiring a decision maker to give the person a fair opportunity of presenting his or her case against the giving of a direction, including an answer to the alleged non-compliance or contravention. The second aspect of the doctrine of natural justice involves the no bias rule. And this rule requires a decision maker to be free of an actual or apprehended bias. So bias can arise from a decision maker's final or personal interests in the decision or his prior expression of views or his previous role in making the decision. And the bias can be because also because he might have met a person before or he might profit from a decision because, let's say, one of the uh, parties to a case may be a bank or may, in fact, or maybe a, a company to which he might be an investor. So those are uh, possible biases. And the rule is if these biases exist, 
and where if they are actual or apprehended, meaning uh, they can be considered to exist because they are uh, po potential biases that can influence a decision, then in that case, a decision maker must recuse himself or dissociate himself from making a decision because his, his decisions would have been tainted by bias. Now, what, what are the rationales for the doctrine of natural justice? There are lots of good reasons for this. One is good administration. I mean, imagine uh, if the executive would make decisions without even providing persons an opportunity to be heard, even if their rights or their interests or le legitimate expectations may be affected by uh, executive decisions. Or imagine if, if uh, decision makers made decisions, even if they actually were predisposed one way or another in making a decision because of bias that wouldn't account for good administration. The rules of natural justice would also enhance better decision making by ensuring that the decision making process considers relevant uh, information. It would also, uh, the, the rule of natural justice would also promote diligence and objectivity of the decision maker. It would obviously also increase public confidence in the decision making process and the correctness of decisions. And it just reflects basic notions of fairness. Now, uh, the key question that arises is really, when you speak of natural justice, when does that duty to accord natural justice arise? And uh, that raises three questions which Robin Craig and John, John McMillan identify as an implication question, an exclusion question, and a content question, which are questions which we examine uh, further in this uh, lecture podcast. So the implication question asks the question of whether or not there is an implied duty to accord natural justice. And uh, this becomes especially uh, relevant when a statute fails to expressly indicate the, that uh, natural justice must be accorded. In that case, can it be implied that uh, natural justice should be observed? The exclusion question raises that question, has the legislature evinced or expressed an intention to exclude the obligation to observe one or the other requirements of natural justice? And the content question asks the question, what kind of hearing is required to be given? Let's look at the implied duty to accord natural justice. In the case of uh, Cooper versus Board of Works for the Wandsworth District, Chief Justice Earl in the Court of Common Pleas in the UK stated that notwithstanding the failure of a statute to impose a duty on an executive body to act judicially or to accord natural justice, such a duty may be implied in certain cases. So in other words, the, the absence of a statute, in other words, the failure of a statute to expressly state that the duty of natural justice must, must be observed does not mean that an implied duty cannot arise. It can still be implied in certain cases. In the case of uh, Ridge versus Baldwin, Lord Reid in the House of Lords said that the principle, odi alteram partem, or here the other side, or the prior hearing rule, applies to every tribunal or body of persons invested with authority to adjudicate upon matters involving civil consequences to individuals, including, for example, their dismissal from an office, which requires something against a man to warrant his dismissal. In Jarrett versus Commissioner of Police, New South Wales, Chief Justice Gleason also said that there exists an implied duty of decision makers to accord natural justice when the exercise of their power can destroy a person's rights, interests, or legitimate expectations. He said, where Parliament confers a statutory power to destroy, defeat, or prejudice a person's rights, interests, or legitimate expectations, Parliament is taken to intent that the power be exercised fairly and in accordance with natural justice unless it makes the contrary intention plain. This principle of interpretation is an acknowledgement by the courts of Parliament's assumed respect for justice. 
Now, let's just clarify this point, and we're going to be looking at this uh, in greater de detail later on, that firstly, the rule that there is a duty of uh, natural justice that must be observed by ex decision makers, like executive decision makers, only arises when the exercise of a statutory power ends up destroying, defeating, or prejudicing or interfering with a person's rights, interests, or legitimate expectations. In other words, if a decision does not actually deal with a right or an interest or a legitimate expectation, or even if it does uh, deal with a right, interest, or legitimate expectation of a person, it does not seek to destroy, defeat, or prejudice those rights, interests, or legitimate expectations, then the rule of uh, a duty to accord natural justice will not arise. In Kiowa versus West, Justice Brennan said that when the legislature creates certain powers, the courts presume that the legislature intends the principle of natural justice to be observed in their exercise in the absence of a clear contrary intention. Now, earlier, I actually pointed out that natural justice can be excluded, as we, we would have uh, observed from the statements of the various justices of the, of the courts. So because natural justice is a principle of common law, that principle may actually be overridden or displaced by express intent of parliament. So in the case of Jarrod versus Commissioner of Police, New South Wales, Chief Justice Gleeson said that Parliament intends the requirement of natural justice to be observed in the exercise of a statutory power to destroy, defeat, or prejudice a person's rights, interests, or legitimate expectations unless it makes the contrary intention plain. So in other words, the moment that Parliament makes its intention plain, that the rules of natural justice will not be observed, then that duty of natural justice will not arise. So it's actually, it actually means that it is permissible for a decision maker to destroy, defeat, or prejudice a person's rights, interests, or legitimate expectations and not observe a duty of natural justice when such exercise of power would have been expressly and clearly stated by an act or by parliament in the law that it passes. However, a legislative intention to exclude the requirement of natural justice is not something that is to be assumed, nor is it to be spelled out from indirect references and certain inferences or equivocal considerations. So in other words, it is not something that is uh, lightly uh, taken away. There must, before the, uh, the requirement of natural justice is deemed to be excluded, there must be a clear uh, intention or, an ex or a clear expression of Parliament's intention in that regard. Now, the duty to observe natural justice is uh, statutorily recognized under Section 5.1a of the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act of 1977 which provides that an order of review can be sought on the ground that a breach of the rules of natural justice occurred in connection with the making of the decision. And this raises the, the, a question, does this provision have the effect of requiring the application of rules of natural justice to every decision to which the act applies? And that question was answered by uh, Justice Mason in Kiowa versus West in the negative. He said, paragraph 5a does not impose an obligation to apply the rules of natural justice, where apart from section 5, there is no obligation on a person making a decision to comply with those rules or, review, or any of them. When the paragraph prescribes a breach of the rules, as a ground of review, it makes no assumption that the rules apply to every decision to which the subsection relates. Under the general law, it is always a question whether the rules apply, and if so, what rule or rules apply to the making of the particular decision. 
So this is also clear from Jarrett versus Commissioner of, New of Police, New South Wales, where Chief Justice Gleason said that an implied duty of decision makers to accord natural, uh, natural justice exists in a specific instance where Parliament confers a statutory power to destroy, defeat, or prejudice a person's rights, interests, or legitimate expectations, which uh, raises the question of when the duty cannot be implied. In Kiowa versus West, Mason also, Justice Mason also clarified that the duty does not attach to every decision of an administrative character. He said, the duty does not attach to every decision of ad administrative character. Many, many such decisions do not affect the rights, interests, and expectations of the individual citizen in a direct and immediate way. Thus, a decision, for example, to impose a rate or a decision to impose a general charge for services rendered to rate payers, each of which indirectly affects the rights, interests, or expectations of citizens, generally does not attract this duty to act fairly. This is because the act or decision which attracts the duty is an act or decision which directly affects the person individually and not simply as a member of the public or a class of the public. An executive or administrative decision of the latter kind is truly a policy or political decision and is not subject to judicial review. Robin Craig and ja John McMillan also identify other cases when the requirement of natural justice uh, cannot be implied. And these, relation, these, these relate to decisions that do not individually affect a right, interest, or legitimate expectation of a person, such as decisions made by the cabinet, some exercises of uh, prerogative power, decisions of a subordinate legislative character, and some types of policy and planning decisions that affect the community generally and impact on individuals only to the extent that they are members of the relevant class of people. They also identified a set of decisions that does not attract any classic sense to a natural justice process. And these are decisions about uh, eligibility for social support benefits, the assessment of taxation returns, the processing, the processing of visa applications, entry to ter tertiary institutions, and the evaluation of employment applications. In these types of decisions, the decision maker does not bear any obligation in the general run of cases to provide a person with advance warning that an adverse decision might be made or of the sources of information being relied upon in assessing applications. We will observe that uh, in the cases cited by Craig and McMillan, these cases do not involve actual rights, interests, or legitimate expectations of persons, but only potential rights, interests, or legitimate expectations. Now, let's talk about the hearing rule. What are the minimum requirements? There are three minimum requirements. One is that there must be a prior notice that, that a decision will be made. Secondly, there must be disclosure of an outline or the substance of the information on which the decision is proposed to be based. That is a summary of the case that has to be met and an opportunity to comment on that information and to present the individual's own case. Now, the second component, as we said, about uh, the duty to accord natural justice involves the rule against bias. And this is captured in the Latin maxim Nemo debit esse judex in propria sua causa, that is, no one can be a judge of his own cause. The rule requires a decision maker to be free of an actual or apprehended bias. And this leads to the question of what is bias? In Minister for Immigration and Multicultural Affairs versus GIA, Chief Justice Gleason and Justice Gamo said that the state of mind described as bias in the form of prejudgment is one so committed to a conclusion already formed as to be incapable of alteration whenever evidence or arguments may be presented. Natural justice does not require the absence of any predisposition or inclination for or, or against 
an argument or conclusion. Now, this uh, this statement is crucial because sometimes when a case is before or a matter is before a decision maker, it is possible that statements may be made by a decision maker or questions may be asked by a decision maker that seem to suggest that there is a a prejudgment on his part or his or her or her part, or that there seems to be a, a point of view that has already been arrived at by the decision maker. The mere presence alone of what amounts to a prejudgment will not cloud or taint the ultimate decision because it is only natural for a decision maker to have some kind of prejudgment. The important thing is even if there might be some prejudgment, that prejudgment must not be such that he would already uh, arrive at a conclusion that is incapable of alteration, whatever the evidence or arguments may be presented. So in, in other words, so even if there is a prejudgment, for as long as the decision maker is open to changing that uh, prejudgment on the basis of the evidence or arguments that are presented, then he does not, he or she does not run afoul against the rule on having a bias. In Minister for Immigration and Multicultural Affairs versus GIA, Justice Hain also said what is meant by bias and apprehension of bias. He asked, bias is used to indicate some preponderating disposition or tendency, a propensity, predisposition towards predilection or prejudice. It may be occasioned by interest in the outcome, by affection or enmity or by prejudgment. Whatever its cause, the result that is asserted or feared is a deviation from the true course of decision making for bias is anything which turns a man to a particular course or gives the direction to his measures so uh, before we conclude this uh, lecture podcast let's assume that a there is a case before a decision maker and the decision maker happens to know one of the applicants or one of the parties and in the past uh, the decision maker and the applicant have not had a good relationship, maybe out of enmity or out of some past incident. That is an example of an instance where there might be a bias on the part of the decision maker. And that will be a breach of the rules of natural justice if the decision maker continued to hear the case notwithstanding the presence of bias. Another instance might be when a decision maker might have a financial interest, potential financial interest in the decision in the sense that he might be uh, an investor or owner of a, of a corporation or a company, for example, that is one of the parties to a case. But uh, the courts have also been clear that the mere fact that a decision maker may own shares uh, in a company will not necessarily mean that that decision maker is disqualified from uh, hearing the case for as long as the decision maker informs the parties in advance. So the mere ownership of uh, shares of stock in a certain company, such as let's say a bank or an airline company as an investment, will not necessarily disqualify a decision maker from hearing a case for as long as that decision maker informs the parties in advance. Only when such an ownership will make it difficult for the decision maker to actually arrive at an unbiased position will there be a need for the decision maker to disqualify or accuse himself or, or herself? So at the end of uh, this topic of this lecture podcast, it is hoped that you should be able to discuss and explain the principle of natural justice and when it applies, the hearing rule, as well as the rule against bias.